Welcome everyone to the 2021 Jim Hay Memorial Session. My name is Jill McNichray and I will be chairing today's session. In this session, Dr. Peter Wayan, the recipient of the 2021 Hay Memorial Award will be delivering the Jim Hay Memorial Lecture. His lecture will be followed by a presentation from an invited colleague and longtime collaborator, Dr. Matthew Bundle. I will ask Drs. Wayan and Bundle to address questions at the end of the session. And there will also be time in the spatial chat session immediately following the Hay session for virtual hallway discussions. And I, I wanted to share that what excites me about this Hay Memorial session is the opportunity for us all to think about how the study of biomechanical principles in the extraordinary context of sport can really inform our understanding of performance. And as a young scientist, I always look forward to the opportunity to connect with Jim Hay at ASB in the hallway between sessions. And what I really appreciate was his willingness to listen with an open mind, think through uncertainties in our results and do it together. And I found these interactions really fueled me to ask better questions, consider new approaches in my own investigations and think about the interpretation as well as the implications of my results. And I know we would rather be meeting a person, but my hope is we will in some way capture in our virtual session of the Hay session, how sport has brought our world together as it has in Tokyo. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce Peter Wayan. He holds the Glenn Simmons Endowed Professorship of Applied Physiology and Biomechanics in the Department of Applied Physiology and Wellness at Southern Methodist University, where he also serves as the director of the Locomotive Performance Laboratory. Prior to his current appointment, Dr. Wayan directed research efforts at a large animal facility specializing in terrestrial locomotion at the Harvard University's Concord Field Station and at Rice University. His research subjects through the years have included antelope, emus, rodents, and professional athletes with and without limb amputations. Dr. Wayne's scholarly work is conducted at the interface of mechanics, metabolism, and performance at the whole body level. He explores running and different forms of locomotion from backward running to one leg cycling using experimental modeling and comparative approaches. His work is well known to academics, practitioners, and professionals from a number of performance related fields. And this work has often moved from experimental settings to contemporary practice and has received attention from a variety of meeting media organizations such as NPR and the New York Times. He'll be sharing with us today what he has learned over the years about form, function, and physics through his experiences in studying performance and in the context of running. Congratulations on the 2021 Hay Memorial Award from the American Society of Biomechanics. Peter, the session is yours. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, Jill. And, and moderating, it's, it's nice to have uh, particularly nice to have somebody who's a former Hay Award winner, uh, winner uh, being the moderator of, of the session. Uh, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to be here and, um, and share some of the work that, that Dr. Bundle and I have done uh, through the years. So um, I'm going to share my screen and get the show going. Is it coming through okay? All right, away we go. Uh, so the performance outcomes in science that I'm going to talk about today are very much in the spirit of the Hay Award, and I'm, I'm very grateful to be in a position to, to share the work with you and, and deliver this symposium uh, um, for a lot of reasons. So there, there's two parts to it, and, and I'll do the first part, and my colleague, Dr. Matthew Bundle, will do, do the second. Uh, and the work that I'll present is work that has been very much a partnership between the two of us. Uh, that spanned a couple of decades now, actually slightly slightly longer. Uh, so I'll do the, the basic kind of foundational work um, that per the title uh, on, on the non-amputees, the biological legs, uh, basic work we did with athletes. And then uh, Dr. Bundle, uh, Matt is gonna do those, those applications to the, uh, those, the runners that run with, with artificial limbs. And part of the reason that I'm, I'm very grateful for being here and the opportunity to deliver the symposium is because my scholarly values, even though I've come into it from a very different path than, than most people that, that are involved in um, what could be classified as sport biomechanics, is that I've always had a passion for performance outcomes. My own experience as an athlete really led to, to that passionate interest. And uh, of course, that's the, the core reason for this symposium as a tribute to, to Jim Hay and, and the quality work he did, you know, asking good, good questions 
um, using athletes' performance and performance outcomes to advance science. So I hope that we've done that, and I look forward to sharing some of this work with you. My path in, into, uh, into doing the human performance that we're doing now really started at human performance, and then it went in a comparative direction. I was fortunate enough, uh, after my PhD work at the University of Georgia, where I was investigating uh, metabolic aspects of human learning performance, to, to, to be a postdoctoral fellow with Dick Taylor at the Concord Field Station, who, and Dick, of course, was a comparative physiologist in the lab there, uh, focused on the comparative physiology and biomechanics of terrestrial locomotion. And pictured also on this slide is Dick's mentor, uh, Knut Schmidt-Nielsen, who, who may or may not be known to many of the people in the audience, but uh, Knut was Dick's postdoctoral mentor. And uh, this is a, the picture here is Knut on the Duke campus with a camel that's a tribute to him and the, the comparative physiology work, work he did on desert animals. Uh, but what they both had in common and what was instilled in me, even though I knew I didn't want to become a comparative biologist, I wanted to study human performance, was really the art of asking good questions. So my hope for this symposium is that the work will present represents questions that are good questions, but, it, but rather than comparative questions in nature, that they use the special questions that athletes can unlock to, to get answers that have both basic and applied value. So our, our lab at SMU uh, is, is really in a lot of respects uh, set up similarly to do the work that we did at the Concord Field Station with force and motion equipment measuring. But in this case, it's, it's all human work that we've been doing for some time, really the last couple of decades since I left Harvard. Uh, and so that's a picture of Dick Taylor on the treadmill uh, riding a llama at the Concord Field Station. Uh, and some of the, a lot of this work was inspired by, uh, actually was the lead-ins to the sprint work that we did ran through um, uh, some antelope testing that we did on the, the, the field station treadmill. Uh, in fact, we started doing the sprint work when we had to, after we geared up the treadmill to go fast enough to run the pronghorn antelope. Uh, and our current treadmill at SMU is uh, uh, one of the fastest in the world. It'll go uh, well over 50 miles an hour and it's force instrumented. So those of you that may have an interest in the work and, to, and want to do a deeper dive beyond what I covered today, um, we, I have a Twitter account where I, chime in on, on these topics. And we also have a lab two page where uh, there's additional information available if, if you're interested. So in terms of today's talk, uh, I'll do parts one and two and Matt Bundle's going to do parts three and four. Uh, and I'll talk initially about speed determinants and limits and then why we should bother with running speed. I think uh, with, in a comparative setting, we, we would often get the question of why we would study emus, ostriches, rheas, flightless birds, uh, kangaroos, et cetera. Um, we don't usually get that question athlete, with athletes, but there's often an assumption that there's only an interest that doesn't, an interest specifically in athletic performance that doesn't extend beyond that. Uh, and we've, we've tried to use the athletes in ways to get to um, basics and applied knowledge that extends beyond them. So the first two parts of my talk that I'll do um, are really for that purpose. And then the, the, the transfer to Matt, Matt will cover um, the applications to the amputees from the basic science work that stemmed from our work predominantly, but not exclusively with athletes, but in every case with performance outcomes. So we started, this is a first sprint study we published. We did this at the Concord Field Station. This is a study that published in 2000. Uh, and uh, our, our approach where we finally got some traction, we, we had messed around with some things that we didn't publish uh, because we didn't have sufficient insight that we felt we really could advance understanding enough that it warranted publication. But uh, an approach that worked very well for us was to run people to top speed uh, and pick athletes that had different speed capabilities, healthy people that were accustomed to running, uh, but they were slow, medium, and fast. And we ran them across a series of speeds, uh, got steady state mechanics at constant speeds on the treadmill, ran them to failure, and uh, measured so we were sure that we measured their top speed. And one of the things kind of is a high level conclusion that's come through from this work and, and work beyond it that's not included today is that we've learned in this first study and it's held up throughout that it's, there's a really simple formula from Newton for what the, the speed and mobility athletes do. Any, 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 any kind of movement where you're supporting yourself on legs against gravity, what differentiates people that are extremely good at doing that versus not so good at doing that is really how much force they can apply uh, in relation to mass to move themselves. So that part of it is really incredibly simple and you'll see that came out pretty loud and clear in this first study. So what we did across a series of speeds was quantify the subcomponents or the timing of the stride. So as you can see here, we broke it down. In this case, what we, we determined or classified a stride as a contact of the right limb to contact of the same right limb. 
and the, the entire stride then is right limb down to right limb down again. There's a contact period of the right limb followed by an aerial period, uh, contact period of the opposite or left limb and another contact period. So what's hatched there in gray is a, is a limb repositioning time for the, the right limb or limb swing time. So the first thing we did was quantify that and, and the forces in the force treadmill, forces applied to the ground uh, during, with our 33 athletes at the treadmill, the Harvard's Concord Field Station. So this is an athlete uh, that we, that is a, actually a triple jumper, but he was running at 11.7 meters per second. So you get a feel for how short and intense these high speed runs are. I'll, I'll show that clip one more time because there's a lot of action that gets crammed into a very short space. And so what we do at every speed, including the, the top speed and the failure speed, is to quantify those, those, the force and those timing variables of the stride over eight consecutive steps where the athlete doesn't, doesn't drift backward on the treadmill. And so the patterns across speed, when you do the test from a jogging speed all the way up to top speed, we have a, what happens off the ground and what happens on the ground. So this is a, an individual runner, and these are representative patterns for that runner. And you'll see that the limb repositioning time comes down from intermediate to top speeds to, to reach a, a low value or lowest value at top speed. Uh, the aerial time for, for illustrative purposes here is two times aerial, so it gets out of the noise of the, the other timing variables below it. But you can see that follows kind of a similar pattern. It peaks in, in, in the middle range of uh, intermediate range of speeds. And then the aerial times also decrease toward top speed. If we, also, if we then focus uh, on the red arrows here, what happens on the ground rather than what happens when you're off the ground or in the air, uh, the foot ground contact time drops consistently across speeds to reach a minimum of top speed. Uh, and, and the forces go up the entire time as, as, as people run faster and faster. And the product of, of the contact time and the force, uh, the impulse uh, also reaches a maximum at an intermediate speed and then falls as, you, as, as runners go to faster and faster speeds. And that drop in impulse is, is important because the impulse sets the lift of the body. And so a minimum impulse is required to get the time in the air. Uh, and so the impulse falls because the contact times get so short at these very fast speeds. And this runner was reasonably athletic. His, his minimum contact time is on the order of about 0.11 or 0.12 seconds. So in terms of what, what determines whether one person is faster than another, it's entirely determined by what happens on the ground. The faster people apply more force in relation to their body weight, and they do it in a shorter period of time. So these are the top speeds of those 33 individuals. They spanned a nearly two-fold range from just, uh, just under seven meters a second to over 11 meters per second. Uh, so the fast people apply more force in relation to body mass, and they do it in less time. And, and as you can see, the variable among these two that's tighter is the time variable. You can see the scatter is, is a little bit tighter um, for the contact time speed relationship, and the faster, the faster people clearly had shorter foot ground contact times at their top speed. In, in, and for kicks, because we wondered with the, the the time off the ground, the aerial and the swing times were the same. You can see in this, this top, top graph that it's essentially a flat line. So everybody's in the air 0.12 seconds between steps and the repositioning time or the swing time of the limb is just over a third of a second. The mean here is 0.371. And for kicks, these red X's, we took uh, footage, TV footage of the Olympians. We, we compared that and we did 30 Hertz video in the lab to compare it to our force data to put in an offset. And we wondered, could it really be true that the that extremely fast people do not reposition their limbs in, in less time than average Joes do, because that was a very non-intuitive finding. And so our crude look in this, in this 2000 paper said, well, pretty close. Uh, so we were just trying to ballpark it at that time. But as we moved forward, we were able to get data from the track on high level performers. All of these individuals at one time or another held the world record for hundred meters. And, and these timing variables were from quality 200 hertz or higher uh, video acquisition techniques. And so what you can see is if you take the average of these six individuals, and they're some of the fastest individuals in, in the, the history of, of human running, they, they did conform. They're, they're like everybody else in that first study, they were just over a third of a second. So that's a variable that, that is common among athletes, regardless of how fast they are. So if we put them on our swing time graph, we actually were a little bit low when we did this initially with the group technique. But the world record holders, even though they run faster, they, their, their swing times, uh, their minimum swing times conform to the same duration of just over a third of a second. So we, 
what kind of came out of this first study was that there's a common relationship between uh, the stance average forces on the ground and, and how fast people run. And that's true across speed. And it's also true at top speed. So if we take the slope, the slope of the force versus top speed in the top panel here, which was from that original study with 33 athletes, and subsequent studies we did of taking the stance average vertical forces across a series of speed as, speeds as we ran them faster and faster, it, we got the same equation over and over. So this does serve, and that's a remarkable result in some ways that whether it's across speed or different athletes at top speed, you have the same equation of just over one body weight as a baseline. And then for each meter of a second that these athletes speed up, uh, it requires one tenth of the body's weight, a force equivalent to one tenth of the body's weight to go an additional meter per second. So this is a very good normative value just for human running that comes out of how common the timing variables are at top speed and the progression through up to top speed. There's there's certain way people like to run and it's and it's it generalizes across different runners to lead to this relationship. And so there's a strong implication there that the only way to go faster if you want to have elite speed is to put more force into the ground. And as we've tested the elites and moved through uh, subsequent to that 2000 paper, we've tested more and more of them and had opportunities to get a number of very high level people into the lab. And indeed, they, they conform to the same relationship. So if you're going to be an elite male, you need to be able to put down at least 2.2 to 2.3 times body weight for a stance average vertical force in order to get to the speeds to be competitive to run in those events. Uh, so, this, so there's the differentiator, but the limit, and this has come up in these data sets as well as data sets that, we, that extend beyond the presentation today. What limits people, whether they're fast or slow, is, is that contact period on the ground, which becomes very intense because of how short those periods are when people are running full blast. Even the people that are not that fast do not have, a, they have a very brief time for ground force application and a lot of force that needs to get down in order to generate the impulse that's required to get the lift necessary. Make sure I can, you guys can see me to get the lift necessary, have the time to reposition the limb. So speed is, is impulse limited, whether you're fast or slow because of how tense, intense those ground contact periods are. So this is just a reminder that what the athletes do on the ground has to give them enough lift to get the minimum aerial time to reposition that limb. And so this, these patterns were very consistent across different athletes and the elites that we've studied and others since then, um, that they came to this contact time minimum as they progress through speed and they, they're maxed out when they can't go to a shorter ground contact time and put down enough force to get the necessary lift. And in the true elites, these times get really short. And I'm gonna show you that in the next couple of slides. This is Mike Rogers in, on a, in his, one of his training practices. Mike's been into the lab a couple of times with us. He's two-time U.S. champion in 100 meters, and what's going to be highlighted in red there is his ground contact time. He's, we don't have the exact speed on this clip. He's running at about 10 and a half to 11 meters per second. And I'll, I'll play it for you one more time. Mike is slightly shorter than most of the elites, but not much. Uh, and, and so you can see he's in the air most of the time. And for Mike, those ground contact times are just over eight hundredths of a second, so milliseconds. It's 82 and 83 here. And you can imagine that if you're going faster and faster over the ground, that, that con it's almost inevitable that that contact time is gonna continue to drop. So 82 milliseconds is not a lot of time to put down uh, forces that are, that are going to be on average two and a half times your body weight. This is what it looks like in the lab. This is uh, Gil Roberts, who's a two-time US champion at, at 400 meters. And Gil weighs just a, a, a little bit over 190. Uh, pounds. And you can see the forces are plotted here in times we have an animated graph where the force corresponding to his motion is illustrated on the graph to the right. And I'll, I'll point out a couple of things. Uh, the, like Mike, you can see that the aerial periods for Gil are, are longer than the contact periods. His contact times here are 90 milliseconds or below. He's a little bit taller than Mike is. Um, these peaks, you can see, are up around 1,000 pounds, uh, these peaks. And the average, this comes out, the math comes out, the way these waveforms are shaped comes out to be pretty simple. The average stance and average force is typically half of what the peak is. Um, the other thing that's noteworthy here is there's a signature. So all the elites run in the same way, and that results in a pattern of force and time or impulse on the ground that's very consistent. They don't all look exactly alike, but they're, very, they're, they're relatively close, and they all do the same thing. Uh, Mike's, Mike's would be a little bit more rounded and a little bit shorter than this, but you see this very rapid rising edge to an early peak that peak typically happens in three hundredths of a second after the foot 
first hits the ground. And then the falling edge often has this hitch in it. Uh, and, and between the fast and slow people, the falling edge doesn't differentiate that much. All of the action is on the impact and immediate post-impact phase where the, force, where the forces are really high that the sprinters put down. So we use an analogy that the runners essentially use their leg to throw a punch at the ground. And per Newton, if you, if you, if you change the velocity of the limb over a very short period of time, there's a big negative, large negative acceleration. There's a force that's generated just like there is with a punch into, with the leg into the ground that results in that very fast rising edge and those big forces that gives them the stance average force. And this, these findings came out of Ken Clark's dissertation work. Uh, Ken is pictured here on, on the outward portion of this slide. And, and we can explain the instantaneous shape of those waveforms from Ken's work in turn, in a, with a partitioning of the body into the lower limb that strikes the ground and stops quickly and the movement of the rest of the body's mass. And if you're interested in that, there's more on our, our YouTube site that breaks it down from the quality work that Ken did on this topic. So the reason that they do that is because the, the time becomes so constrained. And I showed you how short those times are and that this, the time is, is constrained because people, individual athletes and others um, tend to run with a, what we call a contact length, which is the forward distance the body travels while the foot is in contact with the ground. That distance is a very consistent function of leg length. So in, in elite male sprinters, it's typically one meter thereabouts because their the, the leg length is, is just under one meter long. So the ratio in the elites of the contact length that they run with, the leg length that they anatomically have, particularly with those that strike in the classic ball style, that, that ratio is, one, is very consistently 105. Uh, some of them that land with a slightly flatter foot, that ratio can, can get up as high as 110 or slightly over, but there are not many of them that do that. So the contact times any speed are set in a fairly narrow band based on what that leg length is. And since speed is distance over time, if we take the contact length, which is a distance over the contact time, you can see from the velocity equation of contact length over contact time, that if you're gonna run super fast, 11 or 12 meters a second, like Usain Bolt, you have to drop that contact time to very low values. And there's almost no play or ability to adjust because across intermediate and fast speeds, the athletes don't change the contact lengths that they run with. So in many respects, as an organizing principle, we regard that, that contact length, leg length relationship. The contact length is a regulated variable for running because of how general it is. And to illustrate that, this is a plot with a, a, a lot of athletic male runners. So some of them are athletes we tested in the lab who are not necessarily super fast. This is contact time versus their top speeds. Uh, we have data from Dr. Ralph Mann here in blue from US Nationals. So these are all minimally national class sprinters. And then the gray, the gray symbols are data from the literature for world record holders, some of whom I showed you on an earlier slide. But the take home from this is that nearly 80% of the variation in top speed among these, these males is accounted for by a single mechanical variable. It's their minimum foot ground contact time. So if we pick one thing that's really important for sprinting athleticism, it's the minimum time you get down and back up in the context of a running gait. And you can see how powerful this is, even without taking height or mass into account, uh, we can get essentially 80% uh, of the variation among athletic males with just that single variable because of how consistent the mechanics are that different people run with. So the impulse is, and that last graph is powerful aligning evidence that the impulse is in fact the limiter for speed uh, and, and it's, it's set very directly by leg and contact levels. Okay, so why should we bother? Hey, right? okay, this is fun. You know, it's a privilege to study fast people and athletes that are as talented as some of these people are. It's a privilege to do it in general, of course. Um, but a fair question is the so what question we all need to answer with our research, which is what, what do you do with this, right? And um, that's the next portion of this talk. So in parallel with the top speed work, uh, Matt Bungle and I spent a lot of time focusing on uh, a Jim Hay-like question, which is why is it that people slow down as the duration of their, their sprints get longer? Um, and some of that, it also comes back to these basic mechanics that the top speed work revealed of, of what's important. Um, and some of the applied value, this is, this is a, a, nice, um, a nice illustration of unintended consequences that, that research can have. Uh, on the left here is uh, an accelerometer taped onto Michael Johnson's ankle, a uh, different tape here. And this, this is going into the 2000 Olympics. Um, those stance mechanics that I just described are so consistent that once we, we actually did contact times from the accelerometer for Michael Johnson, 
um, over a series of speeds in order to, to use his contact time speed relationship to predict how fast he would run in his races. And, he, and it was dead on. The stance mechanics were so consistent that we were able to identify to within a tenth of a second for his 400 meter races how fast he ran uh, with a wearable back before we called them wearables. Um, so that's one example, of, you know, in the spirit of Jim Hay of uh, an, an applied outcome that comes from um, a basic finding. And so many of you, I'm sure, watched the Olympics over the course of the last couple of weeks, saw Allison Felix and Ating Mo perform. And this is related to the parallel effort that Dr. Bundle and I under, have undertaken, again, at, at the same time as we were doing the top speed work, arguably a little bit earlier. And it's an old topic. So uh, a Lancet paper from A.V. Hill, who's obviously a, a, an early pioneer in the field uh, in mu muscle physiology and mechanics, uh, as well as uh, whole body physiology. Uh, the early guys did a lot of different things at once. Um, so in the, A.V. Hill in 1925 took the world records of horses running, men running, men swimming, women swimming, uh, different world, at different events, and he, and he plotted them. And the Royal Society in the UK asked him to do a scientific breakdown of, of what, what the basis of these records were. And he concluded on the far end that it was mostly metabolic, but he didn't really know on the short end. And of course, uh, another early pioneer, Rodolfo Margaria, who, who trained Giovanni Cavagna, who's probably better known to this audience as, uh, as one of the, the pioneers of force plate uh, measurements and, and, and uh, in the field of biomechanics. Um, and Rodolfo Margaria spent a lot of time on these issues also. And so we have a common negative exponential relationship between uh, performance capabilities and um, the intensity that can be maintained, whether it's swimming or running and people or horses. And so Matt Bundle and I spent a lot of time on trying to figure out how to quantify uh, the relationship because quantification is an important step in scientific understanding. And I'm going to cut to the quick on this, uh, given the, the length of time that we have to share today and the need to get onto other topics too. Um, the, the quick and dirty on this that took us quite a while to figure out and, and involved a great deal of running from a lot of athletes over a lot of distances until they couldn't run anymore. Uh, and by that, I mean, they went, they went to... Uh, uh, failure over and over for us. What we found was that, you know, to extend the endurance work that had been done, that established that, that upper aerobic limits set endurance performance, 10K running, marathon running, five kilometer, uh, 3000 meters, that those bottom arrows are all supply and demand. So it, the, the limitations on refueling through aerobic metabolism set the mechanical maximums that the endurance runners can, can sustain over the course of their races. And they're very fixed percentages if you look into that literature. But up, up here in the sprint zone, there, there weren't quantitative relationships and we were very interested in identifying them. And so we took our musculoskeletal maximum for running that was a top speed. And what we found was that we could predict the entirety of this curve if we had these, these, two, these two intensities, the maximum musculoskeletal maximum or mechanical max and the aerobic maximum. And we got at that with kind of a, a comparative athletic approach. We, uh, Matt and I took sprinters and middle distance runners and long distance runners. We intentionally recruited people with would have different speed duration profiles to maximize how different they were. Obviously, sprinters are going to be faster on the short end and they're going to slow down more. And we intentionally recruited distance runners that had no leg speed to get a very flat curve so we could differentiate as much as possible to begin to get a quantitative handle on this. And what we found was that just from those two variables, the maximum aerobic speed identified through a discontinuous test where we would measure their running economy or oxygen uptake steady state at, at speeds up to their measured maximum for aerobic metabolism. If we measured that speed, the max aerobic speed, as well as the top speed that I showed you earlier, that's all we needed for these different specialists and a bunch of other athletes that we tested. Uh, and you can see we were at this for a while. This is 366 trials from uh, roughly 25 different athletes who, who, who ran a lot of trials for us. But uh, you can see how tight that is for the line versus the line of identity with just those two measurements two inputs into our model. So it's if you do the math here on the agreement, it's about we could predict over two orders of magnitude in time, three seconds to 300. It's uh, what we could predict. We could predict within two and a half percent what these different athletes were capable of doing in that range on the speed duration curve where there's a lot of variation in how fast they go. So mathematically, this is the formula that's used. We have a baseline, which is the aerobic speed maximum. And then we, we have what we call a reserve, a speed reserve, which is the difference between the top speed and the aerobic maximum. And then we have uh, that expressed as a natural log function. We have a, an exponential time constant, K, times the time of the run. 
And with this formula for a trial of any duration, we can put any athlete on this speed duration curve and know, you know more or less very precisely what they're going to run. And the secret sauce here really was identifying that that K was constant, that it generalized across runners and it sets the shape of this line. So as long as you express it, uh, the difference between the aerobic maximum and the mechanical maximum in relative terms, everybody falls on that same line. So it becomes, uh, it, that, that is what enables us to go from just those two measures to accurate predictions for everybody. But of course, that quantification is indicative of some, something much larger if, if everybody conforms to the same relationship. So clearly there's applied value, but there's also basic implication. And so through the years, we've extended this to cycling exercise and, and Matt has done one-legged kicking and two-legged kicking. And so for these exercises, we've measured mechanical power output, but the model you'll see here for cycling, this is a 2006 paper that we did. It has similar predictive power in cycling. You just measure the peak power output for a two second burst on the cycle or equivalent for kicking. Um, and this gave us, this led to the recognition on our part that these, these burst performances, burst sprint performances were really set mechanically. Um, but we also came to realize that everything downstream of that as you stretched out on that curve um, was critically influenced and in fact determined heavily by what that, that musculoskeletal or mechanical upper limit was. And if, you, if, you, if we also kind of step back and thought about it more broadly and said, okay, where, what are the limiting factors here? I mean, we, we just went through them for running, but we didn't have all of that necessarily fleshed out initially. So when we did this, we realized, okay, you know, the, the innovation that came out of uh, Garrett Van Ingeschnau's lab in the Netherlands with the Clapscape, which prolonged the time of force application for skating, led to faster sprint times. And Jim Martin from the University of Utah uh, fashioned some elliptical cycle pedals and he had people do one-legged power outputs. And as, as he prolonged that downstroke, their power outputs went up. And of course, these mechanical in interventions also raise the possibility that as you change properties for amputees that are bilateral, you can also intervene mechanically to change their performances. So it is a, there, these are examples of how to pull that top, that upper limit on the curve along from mechanical interventions. And one of the things that, that indicates is sort of the classic exercise physiology uh, explaining performance limits for sprints in terms of anaerobic power and anaerobic capacity, just they're, they're not supportable. There is no, clearly if you do a mechanical intervention, you're not changing the metabolic profile or pathways of the athlete. They're performing better with no difference in those profiles just by, by virtue of a mechanical intervention. So the, what's been in the literature for a long time, but, but in kind of a hazy way in terms of anaerobic power and capacity, those are not entities that can be measured or linked to performance. And Matt and I have published an integrated paper in exercise science sport reviews in 2012, where we do a deeper dive on that. But the conclusion for sprints is that the musculoskeletal machinery goes fast enough that the energy supply just follows. So it's really a demand driven exercise rather than an energy supply limit as it is for the endurance exercises. So we can quantify uh, relative intensities and predict performance. So for example, if we use a speed reserve for running, everybody hits halfway between their mechanical max and the aerobic max at 50 seconds, for example. Um, so for, for the sprint zone, we need to, to do relative intensities with two terms. Whereas for relative intensities been expressed for more than half a century for endurance exercise, just by using VO2 max and a percentage. But the equivalent above maximum uh, in the sprint zone is the percentage of the speed or power reserve. Okay. And the last thing that I have to share with you is that the implications of this are that if you can bump up through a mechanical intervention, if you can bump that curve up, everything downstream in that sprint domain follows in a predictable fashion. And this has immediate relevance for the work that we did on, on the Paralympians, particularly the bilateral amputees. So I'm gonna give you some short conclusions. So for sprint running, uh, running speeds are, for humans are impulse limited and, and primarily contact time. They're also contact time determined. That one mechanical variable differentiates very well between fast and slow people. And then for longer sprints, the work that we did on this, and this was harder to get at because um, you can't measure the anaerobic energy release, which was kind of the leading ideas when we started um, before we realized, oh, it's, it's all mechanics and fatigue. It's not metabolism. But the, the longer sprint performances, Allison Felix at 400 meters, Ating Mo out to 800, that they're heavily determined, particularly for 400 and below, very directly run through. They're determined by the top speed. The best way to change those performances is to bump up that top speed on the curve. 
the aerobics have almost no effect out to 400 meters if you're looking at elites. It's very small. Uh, and we can predict it. So we know what changes in aerobic parameters and top speed will do downstream to performance. So predominantly top speed for the sprint events, 100, 200, 400 in track and field and similar durations and other, other modes of exercise. And it's a really a musculoskeletal function mechanical maximum. There's no metabolic limit, direct metabolic limit for these performances. So those are my summary conclusions uh, that for the work that we shared, I shared with you briefly. Uh, hopefully very much in the spirit of, of Jim Hay in using athletes to get at scientific questions that are broadly applicable beyond athletes and, and to, to humans generally and, uh, and, and also can be applied for uh, productive purposes. So thank you for your attention. And I'm going to turn over to, to Dr. Bundle. Yes, let me introduce him. Thank you, Peter. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to include them in the chat and um, I will ask Dr. Dwayan and Bundle to address them after the final presentation in the session. So to introduce Dr. Bundle, he is an associate professor in the School of Integrative Physiology and Athletic Training at the University of Montana. His collaborative work with Dr. Wayan was initiated at Harvard's Concord Field Station and has extended over two decades. They focus together on mechanisms supporting elite level sprinting and exhaustive performances over both very short and long durations. So Dr. Bundo, we look forward to your talk and the session is yours. Thanks very much, Jill. Um, appreciate the introduction. The, for my part of the talk today, I'm gonna to focus on the application of the basic science framework that Peter is, has just finished laying out. And specifically, this will be a tale of several different studies that we've conducted on bilateral sprint amputee or bilateral amputee sprinters. And specifically, these are all athletes that have been competing at the 400 meters um, and in either open competition or within uh, the world para competitions. And for those of you who have followed this work or, or, and, and the controversies that have flown from these uh, studies, you would likely know that there are competing views and that those views have been expressed here in this very symposium as recently as 2018. But what follows from me today will be the incorporation of the scientific framework that Peter has just finished laying out that focuses primarily on the mechanics of gait and and the resulting decrements in performance that occur as people start to run for longer durations. And this is work that, that we have been involved in, in establishing. And so this will be the framework through which I address these particular questions. And we'll start with our initial work that began over a decade ago um, on Pistorius. And one of the things to recognize when we're dealing with amputee athletes, specifically uh, below knee bilateral amputees, is that their limbs are much, much lighter than those individuals who have intact limbs. Here measured for Pistorius to be roughly half the mass of an intact limb. And this is especially important since these are the distal segments that are absent and replaced by carbon fiber and so the moments of inertia will be substantially reduced. And that has very serious consequences for timing elements of gait. In particular, Peter mentioned that one of the things that is consistent among uh, intact limb sprinters is that they all take the same period of time to reposition their limb. But when we obtain the data from Pistorius sprinting at very fast speeds here slightly below his top speed, his data is the black line, the gray line in the background is an intact limb individual. If you were, one of the things that is immediately evident is the period between when the foot comes off the ground and then is replaced again at the, the time period we call the swing time. You'll note that it's much, much shorter than the knee individual with the intact limbs. In fact, it is quite literally off the biological charts. This is a figure that Peter showed earlier, but you'll note here's the data point for Pistorius. Roughly nearly four standard deviations below the intact limb mean. 
And that has very significant consequences for the amount of force that any particular person who was running with this particular gait style would experience. And specifically, it is the reduction of force that needs to be applied because you're not in the air for as long. So if you're not going to spend as much time in the air, you don't need as much force to drive you in uh, off the ground. And as a result, he's able to achieve running speeds, any particular running speed for much less ground force than uh, an individual with intact limbs is able to do. And as Peter mentioned just minutes ago, that that is one of the most selective elements of sprint running. The application of very high forces in short periods of time is what makes it difficult to achieve Olympic level uh, velocities. Okay. And it's important to recognize that these enhancements to speed are not available to all individuals who use running specific prosthetics. So for instance, here we've got the list of top 10 400 meter performances of all time for on the left single limb amputees and on the right bilateral amputees. And if you look at the means, or if you just look at the, the, the uh, individual column record, you'll see that the bilateral amputees are much faster. In fact, the chances that these means are in fact the same despite their numerical difference is roughly one in 10 million. Okay. And then the next thing that I'll draw your attention to is that I've included the years in which these personal records were achieved. And it is the case that nearly every single record has been achieved in the last few years. And that's relevant because back when we were conducting the Pistorius study and then some of the work that followed, it was thought that Pistorius was a generational athlete and that he was able to obtain these, these fast running velocities as a result of an innate capability when what has come to be the case over the last decade is that there are quite a number of other individuals with bilateral prosthetics that are able to achieve similar types of performance. Matt, I'm gonna yes. interrupt you for just a second. Um, we're having trouble seeing your screen is coming through pixelated. Oh. And a, a suggestion from the support crew is maybe you could show it in um, regular PowerPoint and not in Zoom. So we might just take a moment here and see if that can happen. What's happening in the charts and things, it's all pixelated so we can't see the text that you're speaking to when you're speaking, so. Huh. Yeah, so just wanted to share that with you. If you need support, we've got it. So let's just take so, a pause and- uh, Jill, can you, do you see this movie playing? Um, no, I don't. I just, I see it happening very slowly. And I see, um, this is like a video that Peter just showed and you, yeah. and you would see a lot more dots and you would see a lot more of the curve. Okay. And I have a feeling there's things you're trying to point out that we're not going to be able to see. So if we could just shift uh, to be not in presenter mode. Julia, oh, are, you, are, are you just to use yeah. the, the raw? Just to, not in presenter mode. Yeah. And maybe that'll work. Julia, was that your suggestion? Yes. Okay, Matt, great. Can you, um, stop your screen share really quick and just ask you to restart as your whole desktop's looking a little blurry here. All right, I think his connection in general might be a little slow. Yeah, what the heck? Peter, do you have his slides by any chance? I think we're having a connection issue. So I, I don't have them in final form. Um, I could rip them off to you right right away. I'm not. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine to share them from my computer if you get them over to okay. me. Okay. Well, I mean, on my end, now things just maybe just went slight, got slightly better. Your video had stopped as well. So I believe it's just a connection issue. Okay. Well, let's we hear you. Okay. Now, what? Let me. And 
And if I maybe there's some sort of weather happening outside. Yeah, let's let's turn your video off for now and okay. see if that helps your connection. Very good. And then could you provide your slides to either Peter or oh, I? Sure. I will yeah. hold them up for you. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Because we your audio sounds clear. So, so as we work through, I, I'm going to uh, at least initiate some of the question and answers. Um, Peter, if you don't mind stepping up while we sort out the technical difficulties. No, um, uh, no, I, no problem. Yeah, so I'm just scrolling through. Um, I have a comment from Allison Sheed Singer. Um, I really enjoy these talks. Thanks, I'm curious whether the predictive relationship, the force speed and the speed duration would hold between species um, and or on the moon in a reduced gravity environment? <laughs> so I'll, st I'll start with the species question. That one's a lot more comfortable. Um, the, the general trends, which, which you saw in, for at least an equine species from A.V. Hill do hold, hold up. So I think so. I, I think there's, uh, and in, we cover this uh, a bit in the exercise sports science review paper from 2012 that we, if you look at all of that evidence, there seems to be a very strong indirect connection between a reliance on anaerobic energy release, uh, including creatine phosphate that drives those performance, that induces muscle fatigue and drives those, those duration dependent decrements in performance. So if indeed that's the right answer, Allison, then you know because skeletal muscle mechanics and energetics are, are largely invariant across different, certainly vertebrate species, I would expect there to be no, no differences. Uh, now on the moon, I don't know. I, I, I honestly, you know, I'm hard pressed to answer because um, locomotion is is so wacky there and not sort of normally possible at all. Um, there's that famous clip of Usain Bolt trying to run in, in zero gravity, and, and you can't really run up there. So I don't know. Anything I said to you would be really speculative about that one. Um, should I, it, Jill? Maybe you can advise whether or not it's uh, possible to see the screen if, and that I have up now and, and maybe uh, we can give it another crack to get back to the... It would be great to do that. It's still pixelated. So oh, Matt, I, I can play it from here. I have it okay, now. Yeah. It's, op it's open so why on don't my you, desktop. Why so don't you, you go just... ahead and I'll do it old school and just say uh, next slide, please. Yes, that yeah. sounds great. And so why don't we go, um, let's see, make sure I have the right one. Uh, bear with me here. So while Peter's pull, pulling that up, one of the there we go to yep. essentially end the to end the the Pistorius uh, portion. Hold on one second. Yep. So Matt, I think do you want do you want to pick up where you were because these these times are important to the overall message. You want to start there? Do we have time, Jill? Or yes, I, I think we should proceed, okay. and then if we have questions, we can always move it to the spatial chat. So it's not a problem. Okay. I think right. we can now see what you're talking about, and I think it is important you have an opportunity to do that. So go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So, so the critical thing with these all-time performances are that the bilateral amputees are substantially faster than unilateral amputees. So the the uh, enhancements to speed that I was talking about are, are, are not available to everybody that runs on a prosthetic, just those that are using two of them. And the other thing to note is that many of the bilateral performances that are very, very rapid uh, ha have come forth uh, relatively recently. And, and, and so that argues convincingly against the idea that Pistorius back in the late 
2000s and early teens had uh, a was a generational talent and is instead um, uh, taking advantage of or in his speed is enhanced by the properties of the prosthetics. So if you could move forward, Peter. And and the, this video does a nice job of illustrating that individuals with intact limbs and individuals with a single prosthetic, when they have the same top speeds, they have the same weight, have very, very similar ground force, both timing elements as well as, um, as, well as amounts of force and rates of force generation. Next slide, please, Peter. Okay. And if we were to take away or rather impose biological norms onto Pistorius's gait, it would result in a very significant slowdown, roughly 12 seconds on his 400 meter ton. Peter, next slide. Okay. And so as we were coming to the end of this work, we realized that in addition to swinging very rapidly, which is the main mechanism that Pistorius was able to harness, that there would be a second method that bilateral amputees might be able to, uh, to take advantage of. And that would be lengthening the prosthetic. Okay, and this was work that we, a conclusion that we had published in 2010. And then two years later, next slide, actually go two in advance, the next one. Okay, thank you. Uh, and in 2012, immediately following the 200 meter Paralympic final, where Oliveira comes from way back, shown here, to win this race, and Pistorius mentions that it's not fair because he's running very tall, Oliveira acknowledges in the following day that he had been, in, a, in the weeks leading up to the Olympics, has had been playing and, and lengthening his blades, and it took some time to acclimate to that. And as a result of those realities, the IPC and World Para changed the regulations that were in place to govern what is called the maximum allowable standing height, how tall somebody can be when they compete on bilateral prosthetics. Next slide, please. Blake Leeper opted not to conform to those new rules. And as a result, he submitted an application to World Athletics to be eligible to run on his, what are relatively long prosthetics. They're 15 centimeters longer than what his maximum allowable standing height would be. And he's petitioned World Athletics to be eligible to run in the Olympic games and in World Athletics Series competition on these blades. Next slide. Okay, and it, it's important to realize that sprinters in general are tall, both male and female sprinters are, are very tall and, and the tallest group of sprinters are 400 meter runners. But if I'll draw your attention to the red dot at the top of the slide, and that is a uh, leaper standing height in his 2018 prosthetic configuration where he stands roughly seven centimeters taller than even the, this tallest group of intact limb sprinters. Next slide. And what these long leg lengths provide is a very long step length. So if you have a long, a long limb, it provides a, a long distance that you cover while your foot's in contact with the ground and forward it again, please, Peter. And we know that if the time period stays the same, but the length over what, that you cover becomes greater, then speed will be enhanced. Next slide. And so if an individual were to run with the gait characteristics of Leaper, we find that for every one centimeter of leg length that's either increased or reduced, you would gain or lose a tenth of a meter of a second in top speed. And that if his legs were reduced to the maximum allowable standing height based on his other anatomical proportions, the decrease in 400 meter performance would be eight seconds. Next slide. Okay, here it is shown from the uh, speed reserve model, this is how we quantify those kinds of predictions. 
go for it again, please, Peter. And in 2020, the court for arbitration and sport agreed with the presentation that Peter and I uh, in World Athletics in, put forth and the 15 centimeter blades were banned. In late 2020, Leeper again put forth another application having changed the length of his prosthetics by five centimeters. And this prompted uh, testing that took place in February of 2021 in SMU. Go ahead, go forward, please. Where the single most important measure that Peter obtained from testing Leeper in his laboratory was the reduction in top speed that occurred with this five centimeter shortening of the prosthetics. So just as we had anticipated, for every one centimeter of blade length that was either that was altered, we would see a reduction in top speed of a tenth of a meter a second. Go ahead to the next slide. And given that half a meter a second half a meter a second reduction in top speed, we anticipated that 400 meter times would be reduced by roughly 2.1 seconds. Okay. And shown here on the right hand, lower right hand side of the slide, you can see the performances that were achieved in 2018 on the relatively long blades. And then shown in the circle are a series of uh, performances that were uh, completed in advance of the USA track and field championships to determine eligibility for the Olympics. Go ahead to the next slide, please. And so here they are shown sort of more specifically, we had anticipated based on this reduction in top speed of a 2.1 second slowdown at the 400. And you can see that the prediction that we made agrees very closely with the six performances that were achieved in the lead up to the Olympic trials. Next slide. So th these are the conclusions that Peter showed. And I'll just offer a slightly different take. The first is that the, the understanding of gait and performance can be, could easily be very, very complicated. But what we have put forth is a relatively simple framework that has allowed extremely accurate predictions of what might happen, what the consequences of various different events might be. And it's also been the benefits of its simplicity have been that it's been accessible to non-specialists such as the uh, judges and panelists at the Court for Arbitration and Sport or policymakers at World Athletics or wherever, whatever federation they might be. And it wouldn't be the case that the predictions would come out as tight and as accurately as they have if the basic science underpinning these applications was not accurate and not correct. And with that, I'll end. And I thank everybody for your patience with this unpredictable lack of internet connectivity that I had. All right, I wanna thank the presenters for um, their presentation today. I know that there is quite a bit of weather going on. <laughs> um, I've, I've been hearing that in the sessions um, all day today. So I apologize that that's happened, but um, I, I want to also encourage everyone because we'll have limited time here as we need to finish up this session and move into the spatial chat room. I, I know there are a number of questions here, uh, but before we go, I really just want to um, thank uh, and congratulate uh, Dr. Peter Wayne again as our 2021 Hay Memorial awardee and appreciate him sharing his, not only his research, but also his journey and an opportunity to really show the connections um, between a number of studies over the course of his career that have um, given this um, a lot of things to think about. So I encourage you to join the spatial chat and, um, and uh, I believe we have, I'm trying to keep track of all the chat comments. Um, I encourage you to uh, link up to the spatial chat. We'll meet you over there in a few minutes as we make that shift. It'll be an S3 Aristotle. 
And again, I'd like to thank everyone for participating and your questions. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, hopefully we got you thinking. Bye.